Hey everyone, in this video, I want to talk about Azure AD custom security attributes. The ability to let me now add additional attributes to users and service principles, including managed identities, with a huge amount of granularity. This is really useful both for just storing information, but also giving me a great granularity to give permission to access other resources. So in this video, we're gonna dive into what they are and how to use them. As always, this is useful. Please go ahead and like, subscribe, comment, and share, and hit the bell icon to get notified of new content. I can think about Azure Active Directory. So I'm gonna think about, I have my Azure AD tenant. So I've got my great big Azure AD instance. Remember, each company, we have our own Azure AD tenant. Now within that tenant, we have different types of object, but for now, let's just think about a user object. This could be a service principle as well. And what we have by default is there's a whole set of different attributes that I can define and give values to within that particular type of object. Now, what about if I want additional types? Well, I can extend those attributes available. When I do an app registration, I can add additional attributes as part of that app registration. So if I add a particular app registration to my tenant, that can add additional attributes. But it's really only for that particular application. It has very limited additional use. It's really just a directory schema extension. But there are multiple scenarios where I want additional attributes. And I want those attributes to have very granular access management. Maybe I only want certain users or groups to be able to set values for them. Maybe I only want certain users and groups to be able to read the values from them. So I wanna be able to have that very granular access. Additionally, I might just wanna store information that's not specific to any particular application. It's just some tenant-wide set of attributes. Consider the scenario where I talked about granular access to other resources. Well, in that scenario where these attributes are gonna be used as part of an access control, I really wanna be able to separate out who can set values for those attributes than maybe just regular user global administrators, that whole separation of duty. So I wanna be able to do this. And that's the whole goal around these custom security attributes. I can very granularly configure well, who can create the various attributes, who can set values for users and service principles for those, who can read them. So that's everything we're gonna do with these new custom security attributes. And then again, once we have them, I'm gonna be able to use them. And this is a fairly limited scope of resources, but to actually control using access, attribute-based access control on resources. Now this is an Azure AD Premium P1 feature. So I need Azure AD Premium P1 or above for the users that I'm gonna use this functionality with. So I wanna think about, okay, I'm gonna use this. I need P1 or P2 licenses and they come with ever global kind of packages as well. Maybe it's kind of an EMS or an M365, but check, I need Azure AD Premium P1. Now, this is not enforced. It's like many other Azure AD capabilities. As soon as I have one Azure AD Premium P1 user in my tenant, this gets lit up for the tenant and I can configure it. But you as the customer are responsible for making sure you're in compliance from a licensing perspective to only use this for users that have that P1 or above license. Now, when I create these custom security attributes, they are tenant wide. They're not tied to any particular application. When I define these, I'm defining them into my tenant. And what they really are is they're just key value pairs. There's really nothing else special about them. So I have a key, say key one, and then there's some value that I assign to it. Now as part of the custom security attribute, I define the type of value that it can be, like a Boolean or an integer or a string, can it be multi-valued? The actual values themselves get tied to a user or service principle, but you can really think they're key value. 
I can then leverage those for various things like giving access or just storing different types of data. Now, what I can store these on is absolutely, in my Azure AD, I can think about, I have service principles. So, hey, I'm gonna draw a little robot to make up the service principle. This is basically an app registration. So I can think service principle, which remember includes a managed identity, which is just a special type. It can also just be a regular user. So this is where I can leverage these. I can assign values for these different attributes to service principles, managed identities, and users. That's why I'm gonna use these different things. What's really nice about this that's different from a lot of other things where we have identities in the cloud, imagine I have a regular Active Directory. So I have my Active Directory over here. And I have users defined in that Active Directory. And what I'm doing is using Azure AD Connect or Azure AD Connect Cloud Sync, it doesn't matter. I'm creating synchronized users into my Azure AD. Actually, I'm going to draw that green. Now, typically, if we have those synchronized users, I can't actually do much with it in Azure AD. And everything is grayed out. That is not the case for these custom security attributes. So I can apply these values. So I can say, hey, I want this custom security attribute value for a cloud user, for service principal, and synchronized accounts. I have the same full set of access to set these custom security attributes on synchronized accounts as well. So that's a super useful thing. So how do we use them? So the first thing we actually define is an attribute set. So I just drew this idea of, hey, a custom security attribute. What is actually happening is we create a certain attribute set. Now I'm gonna give it a very generic name. I'm just gonna say, hey, attribute set A. Now you would give it a more useful name than that. But the point here is I have this attribute set and I add various attributes to it. So in this case, hey, I've got, again, you wouldn't really call it key one, the attribute name will be something useful, maybe a business unit, maybe project. And I can add multiple. So let's say I also have key two, remember, they're all key value pairs, there's going to be some value set when I assign this attribute to a certain user. So I have these various attributes. So remember, these are all attribute names that belong to a particular attribute set. So that's the key point to these. I have attribute sets, and inside that I have the actual attributes. Now there are limits around this. There's sort of maximum numbers I can have. If we look at the documentation, what we can see is, hey, how many attribute definitions I can have per tenant. So we can see, hey, look, there's 500. How many attribute sets per tenant? set names, description lengths. And there are also certain characters that are not allowed in the attribute set name or the attribute name, and then characters not allowed for the attribute values. So things like spaces I can't have, all these special characters, and then actual values as well. I can have a space in the value, but there's still certain characters reserved that I cannot use. So make sure we understand that. So there are limits on numbers of these things and lengths, and then there are certain characters I cannot use. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to define multiple different attribute sets. So that was attribute set A. Then maybe I also have, um, again, I'm going to give it a very bad name, attribute set B, which itself has its own sets of attribute names. And I'll just call this, uh, I'll call this one project. And then again, it's gonna have a certain type and it'll have a value when I give it to a user or service principal. So why am I bothering? Why am I bothering with the attribute set? Why don't I just create attributes? Project, cost center, business unit, whatever that might be. 
So there's another aspect to an attribute set. And that is what I can also define over here is, we'll do this in a different color, role-based access control. And this has its own role-based access control. So at each attribute set, I can give very specific permissions to who is allowed to interact with things like creating attributes under that attribute set, who can assign values to users and service principles, who can read the values. So now if I think about, I have different attributes for different purposes, different projects, different access, everywhere I want a different set of roles for who can interact with those attributes, I'm gonna put those attributes under a different attribute set because here, I can assign different role-based access control to really say, well, who can actually interact with that? So let's have a quick look for a second at one of these. So I am gonna jump over to my tenant. So I'm going to my Azure Active Directory, and what we see are custom security attributes. And the first thing we have is we have to create an attribute set. Now when I create an attribute set, there's really not much to it. I give it a set name, whatever I really kind of want to put in there. Set A, for example, I give it a description. And then the maximum number of attributes. This is 25 by default, but I can increase that. Remember, per the limits page. So this talks about all the different values and numbers I can have. And it talks about what are those maximums that I could configure. So I create an attribute set. Now, once I create the attribute set, I can then go into that attribute set and I can start adding attributes to it. But before we get to that, the important thing is for each attribute set, I have this roles and administrators. And there are four key roles that apply to my custom attribute sets. We can see here, Ignore that very limited role, that's a custom thing I'm playing with. But I have these idea of an attribute assignment administrator, attribute assignment reader, attribute definition administrator, and attribute definition reader. So there's a very clear delineation there between assigning and defining. And that's gonna be important when we think about actually using these. So how do these really come into play? What are we actually going to do with these? So again, I think about, I'm gonna have different sets based on different sets of attributes I wanna use, who's gonna be interacting, maybe the HR department, maybe there's some special data about people I wanna have as part of the Azure AD. So the HR department would have the role over the attribute set that contained the attributes that HR cared about. Then there's maybe a team that's looking after certain data that want to use these attributes to control access to their data. So that team would have their own attribute set and they would have permission to update the different values. So that's kind of the key point around here. Now, just by default, without anything else, when we think about roles, we always think about, oh, the global administrator. The global administrator can do everything. So here, when I think about the global admin, And what roles does the global admin have? The global admin has none. Now, a global admin and various other privileged kind of role administrators can add and remove roles, so I would want to audit that activity. But by default, unless I go and grant these people roles, they have no access to defining these, to looking at values, to assigning values these very specific roles that I just showed, I need those to be able to actually interact. So we saw there were four roles. So let's think about those four roles for a second. So the first role I'm actually gonna get involved with is, well, I have to create the attribute sets. So the very first role, when I think about my RBAC, is there is an attribute definition, because I have to define them administrator. 
And when I think about scope of what that lets me do, this is gonna let me interact at this level. So what I can do is I can add attribute sets. Now this role initially, because I wanna add the attribute set to the tenant, this role, I'm gonna set at my tenant level. So I need to give someone or some group the attribute definition administrator role at my tenant level, because they're gonna to need to go in and actually create the attribute sets. So if I jump over and look in my tenant, what I have done, if I just go and look at Savile Tech and I go and look at the various um, roles I actually have defined, if we go and look at those attribute definition administrators, remember I wanna do this definition first. So this is the role. So I have given it to myself. So I am the only person that can actually go in at the tenant level, go and create one of these. Now I can see exactly what each of these roles lets me do. So we can see the attribute definition administrator, and this is an important point. Look what it can do. Attribute sets, all properties, all tasks. So anything about an attribute set. Also, anything about a custom security attribute definition, all properties, all tasks. So anything related to the attribute set and anything related to the definition of the attributes themselves, it can do. But notice what it doesn't have out of those two permissions, if we look at the assignment roles, is it doesn't have anything around an actual attribute update, be it on a device, be it on a service principle, be it on a user. So that definition administrator, yes, can do everything about creating the sets, and yes, can create attributes, but it cannot assign values to users for those attributes, it cannot read them. So there's a complete separation. But the first set is obviously we have to create the set. So step one, someone needs that role and they can go and create the attribute set. They don't have to put any attributes in it, they can just go and create the empty attribute sets. So then the step two of this would be, okay, well now I need to actually create attributes within it and then go and give values to certain people or certain service principles or managed identities. So remember the other roles. So if I think at the attribute set level, we had those attributes. So what I'm gonna think about firstly is in this RBAC at the attribute set level, I'm gonna give one or more people this attribute definition administrator role. So once again, but this time it's at this scope, I'm gonna say, okay, I'm thinking the line is here, the attributes. So I can think about at this level, so there's kind of separation here between the attribute and the values themselves. I'm once again gonna give this attribute definition administrator. Because what I wanna be able to do is now add attributes within an attribute set. So in an RBAC world, some user, some group, I'm gonna give that role at a particular attribute set. And then when I actually want to now assign a value for particular attributes to a user or service principle or managed identity, well then I can think about, okay, now I break down. So the values to identities, I'm now gonna give that the attribute assignment administrator. That could be the same person. For some business units, they may both define the attributes under the set and set values for users, or I can separate them out. So here that attribute assignment administrator can now 
both read and write attributes that are contained within the attribute set they have the role to users, service principles, managed identities. There is also a reader role. And obviously as the name suggests, a reader role, well, I can just read those attributes that are part of that attribute set. Likewise, there is an attribute definition reader as well. So what I'm doing now is very granularly giving out those sets of permissions. And we can see this. So if I jump back over again, if I go and look at my environment, and let's look at a different attribute set for a second. So if I now go to a particular set, so for now I'm gonna think about secret identities. I've got one attribute name, and in the roles, what I've defined is an attribute assignment reader. So this means they can actually read, but not write the values. So I've given that to a particular user. If I was to look at a different attribute set, so we close that one, we'll look at the power attributes, which has two attributes in it. This time, assignment attribute assignment administrator, well, is me and Bruce Wayne. So that means they can both assign values for these attributes from this attribute set and read them as well. And likewise, Bruce Wayne is also a definition administrator. So they can actually go and add additional attributes to this attribute set. So I have that very granular sets of permission to this. And there's actually a really nice chart in a blog Microsoft put out that in kind of step three here, it really kind of showcases this. It stresses those different roles and it's really stressing, look, global admin has nothing. And then the key point we talk about is, look, if it's assignment, then they're the only ones that can read assignments, actually seeing the values for a user or service principle, and only the attribute assignment admin is the only one that can actually assign them. Pretty much all of them can read the attribute set, and most of them can read the attribute definitions, but the only people that can add attribute sets or attribute definitions is that attribute definition admin. So we can see very clearly how those names work. Hey, assignment person will can deal with the assignments to users or service principles. Definition, hey, they can deal with attribute sets if it's a kind of that tenant level assignment, or I can create attributes if I have that within an attribute set. So that's really useful to understand those. Now, we saw that the definition has no access to the data itself, and that's a really important point. We wanna to focus to understand we can really separate those various permissions. And the key point is once someone creates the set, they give the R back. So now someone would need that permission, so that could be a completely different person or group would get this assignment role at that attribute set. So now they can go and set project attribute for users, be they synced or cloud or service principles or managed identities, they can go and do that. Now be really careful about those tenant level permissions. Notice at the tenant level, I had the attribute definition administrator. That's because I need to be able to go and create the attribute set initially and then give permission to some user or group to then go and populate the attributes and then assign values to people and that's okay. What I probably really do not want to do is at the tenant level, give someone attribute assignment administrator. Because that would then give that permission for whoever I grant that to at the tenant level to see the value of any attribute. Be it those HR values, um, be it something about access to some resource. And remember, if it's controlling access to a resource, if I give that permission to just some global person, they could set their own attribute to then go and give themselves access to a resource. So I'm breaking that separation of duty. So I'm really unlikely gonna give that attribute assignment or administrator or reader at that tenant level. That would be a really powerful privilege. So I'm not gonna wanna do that. So attribute assignment administrator or reader only give at a certain attribute set. Attribute definition administrator, you're gonna need one or two 
to actually go and create those attribute sets initially. In my tenant, I do have that assignment administrator as well. I'm bored in English. We hardly ever turn out to be the bad guys ever. Okay, so we've created the attribute set. We've given the role to someone within that business unit or who owns that data resource. They have the attribute definite administrator. They can then go in and add the attributes. So as part of adding the attributes, there are different options. So if we go and look over here, back to the active attributes, I can say add attribute. Now while I'm here, remember good old Bruce Wayne, if I go to Azure Active Directory, and if we look at custom security attributes, notice he can't select any of this project attribute or secret identity, but remember, Bruce Wayne was actually given both those roles. He was given the attribute definition administrator and the attribute assignment administrator. So Bruce Wayne can go and add attributes as well. They've been delegated that permission. Remember, as I go and look over here as me as the roles and administrators, attribute definition administrator included Bruce Wayne which is why Bruce has that ability to go and add attributes. So I can absolutely delegate that permission over. And then when I add the attributes, notice we have with attribute name, a description, and then it can be a string, integer, or Boolean. I can also say, do I wanna support multi-values? So they'd be able to go and put in multiple strings or integers or Boolean values. I can also limit it to certain predefined values. Now, if I say yes, it's not letting me set those values here, but what happens is once I create the attribute, so let's just skip over for a second. If I jump back to me, so I did add one of these. So in mine for projects, my primary project, as you can see here, they're strings, both of my values, but then I have predefined values for both of them. So my project can be alpha, bravo, or gamma. So if I go and edit the attribute here, because it's configured as only allow predefined values, once you've created it, you can go and add values. So I can go and add valid values for that particular attribute when it gets assigned to someone. So we have a great amount of flexibility here. So I can go and create these attributes of various, all these different types. And so once you've gone through and done that, so you are backed, hey, someone to define, they've now gone and added the various attributes to that project attribute set. Maybe they also, I don't know, created one called level, whatever they wanted to do of Boolean or integer or string. So the next step now would be that person or part of that group membership who has the attribute assignment administrator, well, they can now actually go and assign values for those attributes to service principles, managed identities, cloud users, or synced users. So they could absolutely now go in, for example, and I might say, well, I have this role. So with that role, for the attributes in the project set I have the role for, I can't assign attributes for a different attribute set I don't have that assignment role for. So only for the attributes within the attribute set I have the role, I might say, hey, I'm gonna add project. So it would kind of be attribute set B, I'm not gonna write attribute set B, but it would be dot project, for example. I'm gonna set your value to alpha from that list of allowed values. So we now go in and actually populate the users. So if we go and look at that, I'm gonna actually now jump over so I could imagine I am Bruce Wayne, because remember Bruce Wayne has that attribute assignment administrator role. So now Bruce Wayne could go and look at users Bruce Wayne could look at Barry Allen, for example, could look at custom security attributes, and notice I have the option to add assignment. I've got the big button here as well. 
Now let's see what it lets me add. I only have that assignment permission on one attribute set. Remember there's three, the others are grayed out. It's only gonna let me add from the attribute set I have that permission on. So I can say, hey, power attributes, and then I say, well, which one do I want it to have? And I might say, okay, sh strengths, and this is a multi-valued, so I can add multiple values to it. I'm just gonna say, oh, yeah, speed. There we go. And now I've added that to Barry Allen. But notice that that's all I can do. I, I can't add other assignments. I can't see other things if they had them. For example, if I jump over, oh, let's say, make sure we save those, make sure you hit save. If I now jumped over and looked at Clark Kent and looked at their custom security attributes, once again, all I see are power attributes. I don't see anything else that may be configured for that user. Because actually the reality is, if I look at Clark Kent as me, John Savile, well, Clark Kent actually has others defined. Clark Kent also has a secret identity and the code name attribute. And it also has a project attribute set and primary project configured. But Bruce Wayne, because it only has that permission, this could be reader as well just to see them, Bruce Wayne can only see the two they have that R back for. So you can really get the idea that we have this fantastic granularity actually being used for this. Okay, so let, let's kind of take this and carry on the example then. So if that's what Bruce can see, what about Clark? So if I look at Clark and go to Azure AD, now remember what permission did Clark have? Well, Clark, if we look at the custom security attributes, Clark has permission on the secret identity attribute set, which only has one attribute. And the only permission Clark has is assignment reader. So it cannot assign values, but they can see the values. So if I now go and look what Clark can see for a user, so let's go and look at even himself, Clark Kent. I can only see SQL identity. I can't see my project. I can't see my weaknesses and strengths, but I can see all of the different values. If I was to go and look at Bruce Wayne, custom security attributes. Hey, I can see the secret identity, Batman. So I can only see that particular attribute within the attribute set I have the permission for. So once again, secret identity, hey, Superman, Kal-El. That's all I can see. So that gives me an idea of that granularity. So this is all about just being able to store information that I wanna be super careful about who can access. Now I'm saying secret identities and powers and weaknesses just for a bit of fun with the DC characters. But again, the whole point here would be, hey, maybe I have those HR attributes that are information maybe about salary or level or social security number, whatever that is. And the key point here is only HR people would have those attribute assignment administrator which would be still a very small number, maybe more in HR might have reader. But then if I was using this to control access to data, there'd be a different attribute set. And once again, I'd be careful about who could actually change those values if they're controlling access to data as well. Which is an interesting consideration. So controlling access to data, so how does that work? So let's think about this for a second. So what I have now have the ability to do is I can add these custom security attributes. Okay. And now I want to think about accessing some kind of resource. So what I'm going to focus on right now is a storage account. And with a storage account, we can have different types of data. But now I'm just going to think about blob. And I've got blob one. Now one of the things we can actually do with blobs is there's a concept called blob index tags, which once again are key value pairs. So I could actually, when I upload my blob, I could say, hey, 
you have a key called project, and you have a value called alpha. I might have another blob in the same container, or it could be a different storage account, whatever that might be. Blob two, will you have a project value of Bravo, for example. And I might actually think about, well, hey, this user had project alpha. Let's say this user had, remember it's the attribute set, dot project, let's say your Bravo. Now, things like Blob supports Azure AD role-based access control. There's Blob Data Reader, Blob Data Contributor. There's all these specific roles. So I could think at the Blob level, if I'm thinking role-based access control, I might... Now, I'm going to say at the Blob level, the container level, it could be the storage account level, it could be the resource group level, it could be the subscription level. Remember, these get inherited down. So there's R back at some scope. Sub, resource group, storage account, container. But there's R back assigned, and remember it gets inherited down anyway. And ordinarily what we would do is within that R back, maybe some group is given blob, could be data contributor, uh, could be reader, I'm just gonna say reader. Now in the past, if I had different blobs that I needed different people to have access to, I had to get these really weird combinations of dividing up the data. I maybe have to create different containers. I might have hundreds of different containers for the hundreds of different groups that need access only to the blobs related to their project. So I'd have 100 containers, or maybe 10 containers per storage account. So I'd have 10 storage accounts with 10 containers each, hundreds of different role assignments. So it was actually really, really painful. But one of the nice things Blob does is Blob actually supports attribute-based access control. And as the name suggests, that lets me now look at certain attributes which is used in addition to the role-based access control. So if I went and looked at a storage account, so what I'm gonna initially do, let's make sure I'm John, I'm gonna look at this storage account and on this particular storage account, let's go and look at my access control. And remember, there are these blob data plane permissions. We can see here, look, storage blob data, contributor, owner, reader. So that will actually give me access to the data in that storage account. It's a data plane permission using my Azure AD credential. I don't have to use shared access signatures or storage account keys, which are really kind of ugly to use. So if I look at the definitions, I can assign that. Now in this example, I assigned it to a particular user. So storage blob data reader, I assigned to Clark Kent. But I want to be a bit more specific. So here on this far right side, you can see this view edit. And this column is all about conditions. So we added this condition. Now this was when I was just looking at things about the data itself. And I added a rule, so it was, hey, if I'm doing a data action trying to read a blob, then this only actually has permission if maybe I'm looking in a certain container name. Okay, the container name was test and the blob path is testing slash wildcard. So I was adding some additional conditions as part of that. Okay, that, that's fine, but it's still fairly complex and there's lots of different rules I'd have to create to actually work that. But I can do and or or, so there's other things I could do. But what would be much nicer, now we have these nice custom security attributes on the security principles themselves, be it a user or service principle, well, now let's actually go and look. Now, I set it at a container level, but there's no reason I had to do that. And what I've done is for the blobs I've uploaded, I configured a blob index tag. And we, some of them are project alpha, and some of them are project bravo, and some of them are project gamma. 
And one of them, just to prove the point, this cloud architect doesn't have any blob index tags. Okay, so then we grant it a role. Once again, we do a role assignment. And what I granted it to is the storage blob data reader to the Justice League group. Now that includes Batman and Superman. But I added this condition. Now what we're doing here is once again, my data action is blobs read. So anytime I'm trying to do that action, this applies. And I'm reading the content from a blob and I'm gonna have tag conditions. So I'm looking at those blob index tags. Well, now what I can do is something really cool. I'm gonna compare attributes. So I'm gonna compare the attribute of the principal trying to access, be it a user or service principal or managed identity, and I'm looking at a particular attribute. So I can see all of the different attributes that exist, and I'm gonna compare it to project attribute set, that's the name of the set, underscore the name of the attribute in that set. So I'm looking at primary project in that project attribute set. And I'm gonna do a string equals ignore case operator. So there's lots of different operators. I'm gonna talk about more about these in a second. And I wanna compare it to a particular attribute. And I wanna compare it to an attribute of the resource, i.e. the blob. And the attribute I wanna look at is the blob index tag, the value in it. So the actual value of the tag Specifically, I wanna look at the project blob index tag key. So whatever the value of project is. And hopefully this kind of makes sense what this means then, the upshot of this whole rule is essentially the principal's project needs to equal the project of the blob index tag. So that's what that rule is doing. So now when I think about using these things together with that attribute-based access control, what this is now letting me do is to say, hey, to get access, that B dot project, that actually use underscore in the rule, so the B underscore project, has to equal the blob. project tag. Only if they equal do I get access. So it's adding a condition to the role assignment. And that's what it's doing. So what this means is this user here with a project attribute of alpha, well, they can access that blob. This user with project bravo, can access that one. But this user can't access that blob, and that user can't access that blob. Other blobs that are not Alpha Bravo, they can't access either. So I'm now using these attributes, not just to store maybe sensitive data, but now using them to control access. So let's see these in action. So we have to follow the flow. So remember the rule is the project has to match that of the user and the blob index tag. So I've got these images. So let's go and look at them. So let's start with the these first two, these do you even Azure. Remember, they have a tag of alpha. So both of these are alpha. Remember, when we think about the users, the only user, let's actually jump over to here for a second, so I can just jump between them very easily. If we look at the values, well, it's Clark Kent has the project set to alpha over here. So Clark Kent is alpha, Bruce Wayne is bravo. So you can see that there. So Clark, based on that rule, should only be able to open up these two files the do you even Azure files, because they have a project of alpha. So now let's look as Clark, so I'm now Clark. If I go to the storage account, and I go to my containers, and I look in images, 
I can see them all because this is just management plane. Now let's actually go and look at the blob itself. So do you even Azure? Yep, I can see it. Do you even Azure? Do you even Azure t-shirt? Yep, opened up. Yep, I can see it. On board to Azure, remember this is the one where it's Bravo, failed. Super Cloud where it's Project Gamma, failed. Cloud Architect that has no tag, failed. Because my project tag does not equal that of the resource. Now Bruce Wayne. Remember Bruce Wayne is Project Bravo. So Bruce Wayne should technically only be able to access this onboard to Azure stickers and coins. So do you even Azure? Failed. Remember in the same group, they're both part of Justice League. Failed. SuperCloud, failed. Cloud Architect rates, failed. On board to Azure Stickers and Coins, has permissions. I can see that very granular checking happening. And this is actually huge. When you start to absorb what this means is there's a finite number of role assignments I can have in a subscription. And it shows it to you. Actually, if we go back for a second and look at this, if I go and look just at access control, one of the things it highlights in role assignments, every time you look at any role assignment, number of role assignments for this subscription. You are using 77 out of 2,000. Now 2,000 sounds a lot, until you start having those scenarios where I might have hundreds of different collections of people needing different access to, in this case, let's say blobs. I'd have two, three, four hundred different roles and just growing, it actually becomes a problem. Well, if I change that narrative and now I set a custom security attribute of let's just say project name they're working on or classification level, and then for the data, I have an attribute. And then my rule, I have a condition that just says, hey, the, a certain attribute of the principal accessing it, being a service principal, manager identity or user, has to match the attribute of the resource you're trying to access. I go to one rule. And remember again, I, these are inherited down. So I set this at a container level. This could have been set to storage account resource group subscription level to apply to everything under that. One rule, that, that's it. This will all get applied through. Now, right now, this is really focused around sort of Blob. Blob is one of the resources that is using this. But a key point is, I think we're gonna see this grow to more data plane type services, even control plane services. I saw something in the forums about they're looking at this even for things like conditional access this would be super useful. Imagine I could tag certain applications and then my rule, rather than having a conditional access policy for every single app, you could then start to just have conditional access policies, well, hey, where there's some custom security attribute on the user matches some tag on the application, this applies. So I can simplify that as well. So I think this is just gonna expand over time. And this storage account example I gave, there's actually a nice little case study over here where it's exactly this scenario. And this is based on a real world scenario where the customer had sort of 128 storage accounts, thousands and thousands of containers, and before they just had this huge number of different role assignments. And as you can see, it could have re required basically a quarter of a million different assignments which was just not possible. We should have to break it over lots and lots of different subscriptions to make that work. Well, they replaced that with a single condition. Just one condition solved the problem. And this is kind of in that description below as always, so you can go and look at this. But these are ridiculously powerful capabilities. So I hope this made sense. Again, think about those two key scenarios I can think about this. One is I have particular attributes that I just want to store data in and be very granular about well, who can configure those values and who can see those values just because I want to store the data. And then 
there's, well, I wanna store some data because I'm using it as that key as part of some condition to then access other data. Where once again, I'd wanna be really careful about who can configure those values because it's probably gonna be the people that own the data. I wanna configure well, who's allowed to access that data. So I create different attribute sets to contain the different attributes that are gonna have a particular set of role-based access control around it. Resource groups today for Azure resources, we put things in different resource groups because I want a certain set of common permissions across them. Hey, I create attribute sets to contain attributes that I want a common set of role-based access control on. Remember, attribute definition administrator at the tenant level, which is a couple of people to create the empty attribute sets. And then within the attribute set, I would give someone the same role, but just at the attribute set level to go and add the attributes and the definitions. And then probably a separate personal group, the attribute assignment administrator to actually set the values and maybe be able to read the values. Do not give that assignment administrator or reader role at the tenant level. So it would let them read anything, which would probably be a very, very bad thing. Remember, I can do auditing, for example, to detect if maybe some global admin tries to give themselves those permissions at the tenant level and that goes to an independent system um, to kind of alert you on that. So that was it. Uh, I hope that was useful. Uh, good luck in uh, trying this stuff out. It's in preview right now. But uh, yeah, go and give it a go. Until next video, take care.